What if I told you that there's one key process we do as humans that entirely constitutes our intelligence? You'd probably scoff and say, well, great. If there's one underlying process that does it all, then let's just program the computer to do that. And then we'll finally achieve super intelligent AI, fix climate change, solve world hunger, and all that other great stuff. But the title of this video is that this is actually a problem for AI. I'll get to that a bit later. First of all, we need to work out what exactly intelligence is before I can boldly claim that I know how it works. Despite all the very intelligent people studying intelligence, the experts still aren't quite sure how exactly to define it. There's endless debate about IQ, the importance of social and emotional intelligence, book smarts versus street smarts, and all kinds of other things. I won't be going into all that in this video, but I will point out that most academic definitions and tests of intelligence tend to converge on similar themes. These are general problem solving, categorization, and communication. Let's start off with problem solving. In AI research, this is usually understood with a search space model, and this involves formalizing the problem into an initial state, a goal state, and operators that transform the current state to a new state. A lot of the problems AI deals with, like playing chess, playing Starcraft, or driving a car, tend to be well-defined problems. That is, they have a clear goal state, a clear initial state, and a clear set of operations. But the problem is, in real life, problems are usually ill-defined. The goal state is murky, the initial state is unclear, and there's an unspecified set of operations. What I'm doing right now, trying to make a good video, is an ill-defined problem. It's unclear precisely what steps I need to take to make this video a good video. I need to make it sophisticated, but not too complicated and hard to follow. I need to make it entertaining, but not lacking substance. Let me hit you with a problem. I'll give you a standard 8x8 chessboard and some dominoes. Each domino covers exactly two tiles on the chessboard. How many dominoes does it take to cover the chessboard? Well, this is just arithmetic. There are eight columns and eight rows, which makes 64 total tiles. 64 divided by 2 is 32, so it takes exactly 32 dominoes to solve this problem. Pretty easy. Now watch this. What if I remove these two corner tiles to leave 62 tiles left? Can you cover the chessboard with 31 dominoes without overlap or overhang? Most people formulate this as a covering problem. They'll try to imagine different configurations of dominoes on the board to see if one will fit with 31 dominoes. If you approach the problem this way, it's combinatorially explosive. The amount of possible domino configurations is so ridiculously large that you'll never be able to solve the problem this way. One participant in a famous study of this problem, who was trained in mathematics, filled up 10 Hillroy notebooks with mathematical attempts at a solution. Now look at it this way. If you put a domino on the board, it must cover one black and one white square. There is no way to put a domino on the board without overlap or overhang, where this is not the case. This means that if you want to cover the whole board with dominoes, you must have an equal number of black and white squares. The two squares I removed are the same color, so that means that you can't cover the board with 31 dominoes. The problem has gone from being combinatorially explosive to very easy just because we reframed it. What happened here? Instead of focusing on how to cover the board geometrically, we instead focused on the color of the tiles and how they relate to the domino placement. Instead of focusing on the irrelevant details, we focused on the relevant details. The central strength of human problem solving is that we can avoid these combinatorial explosions by zeroing in on relevant information. Cognitive scientists call this ability relevance realization. Now let's talk about categorization. We categorize things by noticing how they are similar to each other. And we do this automatically. But how do we explain it? Any two objects possess an indefinitely large amount of shared characteristics. A grapefruit and my computer mouse both contain carbon. They both weigh less than a ton. Neither of them existed 300 million years ago. Neither is a particularly good weapon. Neither has appeared in a basketball game. And so on, forever. After I listed those similarities, your response might be, yeah, that's true, but those things are irrelevant. But how do we know what characteristics are relevant? 
Here's a list of things I might find relevant in a given scenario. Spouse, children, pets, works of art, explosive materials, toxic materials. How can those things possibly be related to each other? Your house is on fire. Oh, now that all fits. The problem we have here in categorization is exactly the same as problem solving. We are met with a combinatorially explosive set of information, and we somehow zero in on the relevant information in a powerful way that allows us to form categories. Okay, so finally we have communication. When we talk to each other, we're always conveying a lot more than what we're actually saying. I stop on the side of the road next to you, roll down my window, and say to you, I'm out of gas. When I say I am out of gas, I don't mean that I need to be more flashlant. I'm referring to something associated with me, probably my car. When I say gas, I'm referring specifically to gasoline, not helium. I'm also not just telling you that I'm out of gas, I'm also asking something. I'm asking for directions to a gas station, and not just any gas station, but one that is nearby. If this situation actually happened, you probably wouldn't have any of this confusion about what I was telling you. You're able to make sense of what I was saying because you can understand relevance. Now you may be saying, but GPT-3 solved language already. You don't need relevance realization. GPT-3 is pre-trained with enormous amounts of text from the internet. It can identify patterns in text and generate human-like communication. But it's doubtful that this system actually has any true understanding of the text that it is parsing or generating. See the Chinese room argument. So what I've done here is show that the three primary aspects of intelligence I identified, problem solving, categorization, and communication, all depend on relevance realization. You may take issue with how I have described intelligence, but I bet that you would be hard pressed to find an intelligent behavior that does not involve this process. Okay, so if our ability to identify relevance is the key here, let's just program a computer to detect relevance algorithmically. Well, the problem is, relevance realization can't be a specialized mechanism in this way, because it will encounter the frame problem. Here's a thought experiment by Daniel Dennett. A robot is designed to retrieve batteries as its food source, and transport them to another location to consume them. Suppose our robot comes across a wagon, upon which there is a battery. But here's the catch. There's also a bomb on the wagon. The robot correctly reasons that if it pulls the wagon, the battery will come along as an intended effect. But the unintended side effect is that the bomb comes with it and promptly destroys the robot. Okay, so let's just fix this robot. We'll have it pay attention to the potential side effects of its actions. Okay, well now the robot is stuck endlessly calculating. What's gone wrong? Well, for the robot to attend to potential side effects, it has to create two lists. One list of relevant potential side effects, and one of irrelevant potential side effects. Each of these lists is indefinitely large, so the computation can't be completed. The robot can't just ignore all the side effects, because it will miss important things, like the bomb. But it also can't check every possible side effect, because it would be combinatorially explosive. For an agent with a relatively simple goal, it must somehow intelligently ignore a great deal of information, which seems paradoxical. Attending to relevant information requires putting a frame around your cognition, hence the frame problem. The problem is, we can't actually have a scientific theory of relevance. Why not? Well, for the same reason we can't have a science of blue things. The class of things that are blue is not stable. Some things that are blue now won't be blue later and some things I find relevant now, I won't find relevant later. When I was working on that chessboard problem, the quantity of black tiles and white tiles is very relevant, but the following week, when I'm playing an ordinary game of chess, that information isn't relevant at all. The class of things that are blue is also not homogeneous. There's no characteristic or similarity holding them all together, aside from the mere fact that they're all blue. The same is true of relevance. There's nothing deeply similar about the things I find relevant during a fire, aside from the fact that they're all relevant during a fire. So because we can't find a criterion for what is relevant in a given situation, we can't create a relevance detector to program a computer to do it. But all hope is not lost. We can instead try to find a theory of how we realize relevance. 
Let me hit you with an analogy here, evolutionary fitness. There's nothing essential about what makes a species successful enough to survive long enough to reproduce. It's not intrinsic to the physics, biology, or chemistry of the creature. Some do it by being very large, and some by being very small. Some do it by being hard, and some by being soft. The environment is so complex, differentiated, and complexly changing that different niches emerge. Fitness is constantly redefining itself through the constantly changing environment and competition. There may not be an essence to evolutionary fitness, but we don't need one. We just need a theory of how fitness is constantly realized in a self-organizing fashion, which is Darwin's theory of evolution by natural selection. We can think about relevance realization as a kind of cognitive fittedness, how the mind orients itself to its environment effectively. A key aspect of human beings, as living things, is that we are self-organizing, and we also have the intrinsic goal of preserving our own self-organization. Philosophers call this structure autopoiesis, and it's a fundamental property of living systems, from eukaryotic cells to human beings. Relevance realization seems to depend on this autopoietic structure. To realize relevance, we need to be a system with goals that are internal and constitutive. We aren't just disembodied cognitive systems. We also have bodies. Our bodies are essentially economies. We have valuable resources like time, metabolic energy, and processing power. We distribute these bodily resources to serve the constitutive goal of preserving our body itself. Notice that we say we pay attention to things. Our bodies are not just vehicles of our cognition, but they are a deep part of it. We're also not just cognitive bodies existing in a blank void. We're always embedded within an environment. Back to the evolutionary fitness analogy for a second. The fitness of a creature is not a property of the creature itself, but a property of the creature's interaction with their environment. A great white shark is not intrinsically adapted because if you put it in the Sahara Desert, it'll die within minutes. The same is true of relevance. Objects or concepts aren't intrinsically relevant, and relevance also isn't a property of our subjective minds. Relevance is co-created based on how the environment and embodied cognition are fitted together in a dynamic way. So the question is, can AI do any of this? Well, we're not totally sure. It depends on what you mean by AI and computation. Alan Turing described computation as a system constituted by the manipulation of binary symbols. If that's what we're working with, we probably can't get relevance realization. This kind of computation is defined purely syntactically, and relevance realization requires semantics, or meaning. There's nothing meaningful about a piece of code by itself. The meaning is only assigned when a human interprets the code and understands what it's doing. The code itself is just manipulating symbols, it has no understanding of what it's actually doing, or the purpose it's serving. Now for most practical purposes, none of this actually matters. If a car can drive itself, or GitHub Copilot auto-completes code, who cares if the system is actually intelligent in the strict sense I described? What's at stake here is the prospect of building true intelligent machines, not whether AI can do complicated, useful things. With our current AI methods, no matter how big our data set or how powerful our processing power, we will never achieve true relevance realization or intelligence. We will always hit a brick wall with the frame problem because our AI systems are not autopoetic, embodied, or embedded. If we are to build intelligent machines, we will need to reformulate the problem of artificial intelligence, achieve new insights in science and technology, and above all, make sure that we're realizing what's relevant. Thanks for watching.